So let me tell you a story. And uh, there are some people in this room who know pieces of this story. Bob is probably the only one. Pastor Bob is probably the only one who knows the whole of this story. But I declined to interview several times before accepting this position. <laughs> and you might be thinking, that's a funny thing to say on somebody's first Sunday up front talking. But what you have to realize about me is uh, what you see is what you get. I'm an open book, uh, except for the one thing I like to keep in mystery is how to pronounce my first name. <laughs> so Amos, 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 depending on who you are, Grunendijk is the last name, in case you're wondering. But uh, to get you back or up to speed on that uh, earlier statement of declining to interview, I need to give you a little bit of backstory. So I am the son of an Iowa farmer, and I was the first, I think, in my direct family line to graduate from college. My mom joined me a couple of years ago with a four-year degree. So how long ago was that? How long ago was that? 2012. So she's younger than 50, but she got her degree in her 50s. So I'm proud of her for that. Um, okay, so I left for college. It was this big sad event because I don't think, you know, I was the f oldest son and everyone was crying, think I would, thinking I would never come back, which wasn't technically true. But uh, I went to school in West Michigan. I lived there for most of my adult life, uh, 10, 11 years. Went to school there, went to seminary there, um, and started a church there later after I married my wife, Allison, who many of you have met. There was, uh, really loved it there. West Michigan is beautiful. You've got food and culture and lakes. Uh, Pennsylvania reminds me a little bit, actually, of West Michigan. A lot of good things going for us, right? You guys like Pennsylvania? You all live here, most of you? So anyway, we had started a church, as I mentioned, never got off the ground. We closed the church, and God did some things that brought us back to Iowa. And we thought that was going to be where we lived forever. This was two years ago. Um, and th but it didn't take long before we realized that God was calling us somewhere else. And but we didn't know where. And we were uh, coming to God saying, we're open, right? Send us wherever you want. Uh, we want to say yes to you. We'll go anywhere. But we'd really like to move to California, <laughs> at least south and preferably west, so we're not in the desert, we're not in Missouri. Uh, so we, we started to put feelers out there, we started to have conversations, you know, where do you want us to move, God? Uh, and the reason that I kept declining to interview with, with you guys, with Bob, is because I couldn't see myself living on the East Coast. So Bob and I are starting to have conversations, and Allison and I have a Skype kind of just, it wasn't really an interview, it was just to get to know you, and we were, we were expecting that that was going to be the last conversation that we had with Bob, and Marilyn joined us on the call too. Only somewhere in the middle of the phone conversation or the Skype conversation, Allison and I look at each other and we're like, I think we need to keep having conversations with these people, but we're not ready to come out at interview yet. That's like too high a commitment level. Like if you're dating, you go and see the parents, that's like now it's... <laughs> You know, there's, there's stakes at that point. There's risk. Um, so we declined to interview, and we're like, we're going to keep praying about it. And I got to the point where I realized, you know, we, don't, we won't know. If I really, I say I'm open to wherever God leads us. Uh, and if I'm really open, I'm going to go and see what it's like, right? You can't know until you go. So this was back in March, but I hadn't accepted the invitation to interview yet. I was ready to, I was, had put a timeline on the ex acceptance of the interview. Are you guys bored yet? Sorry, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've almost interviewed, but not quite. Um, and I was at a conference. I was at a vineyard conference. Uh, Phil Stroud, our national director, was there. Uh, and it was, a, what do they call it, cause conference? Have you guys heard of those? It's a lot of young people, people in their 20s. It's like people are all about saying yes to God there. Like anything God, I will do it. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of youth. There's a lot of exuberance. Um, anyway, so there I am. I think it was a Thursday. And I say, God, I want to go back to Michigan. About ready to say yes to interview with Bob. There's actually 
seemed what seemed like an opportunity for us back in Michigan because I missed Michigan. I actually realized I had this like emotional infatuation with Michigan. Every time my wife and I wanted to go out on a date, we'd look at the restaurant list in Cedar Falls, Iowa and think, I wish we lived back in Michigan where all our favorite restaurants are. Every time it was warm and wanted to go to the beach, the closest beach was about an eight hour drive from where we lived. In Michigan, it was a one hour drive. You see where I'm going? I say to God on a Thursday, God, I'm moving back to Michigan, and I'm putting my head down on this unless you stop me. Two days later at this conference, uh, I had been praying for people at that point, but I hadn't received prayer yet, and Phil Strout uh, invites everyone forward and says, if you feel like you need to be commissioned, come on forward. And I knew I was headed somewhere. I didn't know where yet. I come forward, and there is this lady that walks up to me, and I, this hasn't happened very often in my life, but as she walks up to me, I realized that like, the power of God is like, kind of emanating out of her. Like there was this, I almost fell over but didn't want to fall on top of people, so I didn't fall over. Okay, like this doesn't happen to me very often. God has my attention because I feel like the palatable nature of his presence. And the first words out of her mouth were, don't go back, go forward. So I called up my Michigan friends and said, the deal is off. <laughs> uh, I'm not going back to Michigan. I don't know where I'm headed. Uh, there was a little bit of trying to understand what God meant with that. I ultimately say yes to interview here, even though there's a couple of other places. Southern California was one of them that we had yet to have conversations with. So I'm here, and it only took three days for me to fall in love with you people. <laughs> um, and. I realized after I'd come to love you uh, that I, I wanted God to speed up this process. There was a couple of other churches that I was in conversation with. So I prayed, God, I don't want to drag these people along. I don't know necessarily that I'll end up here, but could you speed up the process? When I was, uh, I was staying at Hans and Janet, I got a text from one of the churches and a phone call from the other to take like the next steps. And within, I mean, every conversation from there on, God was nudging us here. It's been one of those times where we knew exactly where God wanted us to be in our move here. We feel like this is an assignment, and I'm not saying that begrudgingly. I mean, we're here on assignment. Like, this is following God's calling. Some of you guys know that if you're doing pretty much anything without calling, anything hard, you'll give up. So anyway, I'm, I'm saying I'm not gonna give up on you. Uh, <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm not really here for you, I'm here because of Jesus, okay? And, and there's, I don't know if there's a moral to that story, but here's my main point, okay? Say yes to God. This is a quote from our current national director, Phil Strout. He, I don't know if he coined the term, but he uses it a lot. And this is part of our series in our core values series, okay? So this is one of those, it's not a Wimberism because it wasn't Wimber, but it's something that you're starting to hear around our movement in the vineyard. Say yes to God. And so last week, if you were here, right, uh, Bob taught on the Father heart of God, language that's used. You remember this? I want you to all keep this in mind as I speak today, right? God loves you and he, if you were here, good job. <laughs> if you forgot, it's okay. Uh, but, but keep that in mind. And Bob talked about values as being the thing that gives us flavor. That was helpful to me. I think of uh, values as the things that are in our heart, okay? Like the series name is named Core because I think our values are very close to the center of who we are. So if you think of Iron Man, right? Iron Man has this core. Anybody here like Iron Man? Okay, good, a couple of you. Right, that's where his power comes from, right? That's what gives him his... They're not really superpowers, they're like robot powers, I guess. But if, that's, if that heart, right, if that source of power is taken away, not only does he lose his powers, Iron Man actually dies, right? So the Bible alludes to this fact in Proverbs where it says something along the lines of just as water reflects the face, one's heart reflects the life. So in other words, our values, what we value, uh, the things we're talking about during this series are the things that drive and affect and shape all the decisions we make, uh, I think, as people, but also as a church, right? You tracking with me? That's something I say a lot, sorry. You'll hear me. That means are you 
is this making sense? When you hear, are you tracking with me, that's, is this making sense? So, to land on this say yes to God value, thing that's being said in the vineyard, we're going to jump into 1 Kings chapter, I think it was 17. Oh no, I don't have my notes open. Give me a second. 1 Kings 17, and we're going to start in verse 1. Some of you remember we talked about Elijah last time I was here. I can talk on things other than Elijah, I promise. So, 1 Kings 17, chapter, verse 1. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve... There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except by my word. So we're landing in the middle of this bigger story, okay? Ahab is one of the kings of Israel. He's a really, really bad, wicked king. And there's this prophet. This is actually the moment that Elijah, that you read about for several chapters afterward, steps onto the scene. And his first words are, there's going to be a drought until I say so. Now verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Cherith Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, uh, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Some of you know this story. It's a relatively familiar story, right? There's more going on here than first meets the eye. And what opened me up to this was this word brook. So I was just looking, I'm not that good at Hebrew with the language that the Bible was written in, but I was just looking at some of the Hebrew, trying to figure out if there's anything that would pop out. That word brook is not actually well translated. Uh, It really means wadi. But the reason they translate it brook in like Europe and America is because there's no such thing as a wadi around here. Does anybody here know what a wadi is? Don't think Pennsylvania brook, okay? Like little stones and flowing water and real peaceful and supply. This, this is something totally different. A wadi is something, I think it's an Arabic word, and they're unique to like the Middle East and Israel. So I have a picture up here, and this is a picture of Jerusalem, right? You might recognize that Dome of the Rock there. Uh, once you get east of that, east of Mount, the Mount of Olives, right, right behind the Dome of the Rock, you have what's often called in the Bible the wilderness, Now, the reason that it's so dry and arid and there's wilderness back there is because as the moisture comes in, it hits that high point of the Mount of Olives, and then as it tapers, all the rain drops, and then as the elevation goes back down, it doesn't rain again for like 100 miles. So very arid. God says to Elijah, head east, right? Head in that direction toward the wilderness. So in the, I had forgotten this until I saw that word wadi, but uh, they had built, they've built a monastery in the traditional site of where Elijah was fed by ravens. You know that because of our friend, the monk, Father Lazarus. Uh, there's some funny stories associated with him that involve hippies and football and brownies, but you'll have to ask me about that some other time because <laughs> I don't have time. That'd be off the subject. Okay, so here's the monastery. Here's me standing in the monastery. So I want to bring you to this place. This is the traditional site. Maybe not exactly where Elijah was, but give you a sense of the landscape, okay? So it's very dry, and it, there are sometimes water that flows. But as you can see, there's these sheer rocks. Go to the next picture. Yeah, that one. And when it rains, it like goes to flood stage. All the water just quickly rushes down into the bottom of the ravines, into the valleys. And then there's water but then it very quickly dries up. Elijah had just said there's not going to be rain, right? There's going to be a drought, and yet he sends, God sends Elijah to a wadi. Now to compound this, and the reason I think that this is something that's going on here is God says I'm going to send what to feed you? Ravens. Ravens, at that time, had the reputation of not even feeding their young. It's not actually scientifically true, but if you read the Bible like a science book, you're going to get into other problems at different points. But, it's a different subject off top. There's, there's passages in the Bible that allude to this fact, that ravens, like, abandon their young. So God is saying these birds, who don't even care for their own young, are going to care for you. You know where I'm going with this? This makes no sense. 
This is like borderline idiotic what God is asking Elijah to do. This is illogical. Like to make sense of this command would not compute. This does not sound like a good idea. This is not good life planning. This is not a good investment strategy. This is not good, okay? Some of you have been on that side of a command from God before. Go do this thing that doesn't necessarily make sense, that shouldn't provide for you in the ways that the world says they should provide for you, right? Some of you have reorganized your entire life, given up careers to say yes to God, to do this thing over here. Uh, Some of you have given up jobs and your family doesn't understand because it was a good job, it was providing for your family, and and you gave it up to do this, this thing that God has done, and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily easy, it didn't always make sense, but you did it, okay? Some of you are at the beginning of that, wondering if God might be asking you to risk and sacrifice, and you're not sure how it's going to end up, right? But what happens here? Verse 5, 1 Kings 17, verse 5, so Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Cherith Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. There's a big deal packed into that sentence, into those short sentences, especially that first one. It says, Elijah did what the Lord commanded. I looked at the Hebrew on this. I thought maybe there would be something good to preach on the word did. There's nothing. One of the biblical dictionaries says this is the most generic word you can have for this. It's so matter-of-fact. Elijah, God commanded Elijah to do this thing that made no sense. Elijah did it. Now, this, is, uh, this answers one of those big questions, I think, for me, for us in life. How do we walk with God? How do we live this spiritual life out? How do we keep going on our journey? It says, he went and he did according to what the Lord had told him. He went and did exactly what the Lord God had told him. And it's in that dynamic obedience. It's in this, God says, and then Elijah does, God says, and then Mike does, that we live out this faith. It's not a dead thing. It's not a dead relationship. Sometimes we think about Jesus and God as this dead relationship who wrote this book a long time ago, and so we do what the book says. But no, in the vineyard, we believe that this is a dynamic, intimate dialogue between us and God. And when God says something, right? Then we do it. Sometimes hard to know exactly what he's saying. We might get to that later, if not today, another time. But the story here for Elijah is not over yet. So in verse 7, sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath and the region. Wait, did you catch that? The brook dried up. Elijah obeyed and then was provided for throughout that obedience. Was it a miracle that there was water flowing in that brook, in that ravine? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not going to go out to that. But God provided him in the ravens for sure. Ravens don't typically do this, if you've ever seen them flying around. They've never brought me a sandwich. But Elijah obeys and God provides for him in that obedience. And then the brook dries up. Where Elijah used to be able to go to receive water and nourishment and fulfillment no longer comes from that place that God had told him to go. Has anyone here experienced that in your spiritual life? We were called to Iowa. We bought a house. We were putting down roots. And within a year of what I believe was hearing God clearly to go to that place, the brook dried up. So we started searching and we started looking. People have called you to do these hard things and they were hard and they were fruitful and then it seems like there's just not life in that thing anymore that God told you to do. The brook dried up. You, you met God in this particular way at that particular conference because you did that particular thing and so you keep trying to do that thing over and over and over but the brook has dried up. If you stay too long at the dried up brook, you too dry up. You tracking with me? 
This is a dynamic relationship that God has with Elijah, not a static one. It's in a living relationship, not a dead one. That's the relationship that he wants to have, is offering to have with us. God says to Elijah, I sent you to the brook for a season, right? It's no longer that season. I'm asking you to do a new thing. I'm giving you a new assignment. This is a new season. I have new provision for you. I have a new assignment for you in this new season. So we'll go back to verse 7 there. This time I'll keep going. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go to once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. What do you know? He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? This is normal. Nothing particularly strange about a visitor coming into town saying to a woman, could you grab me a glass of water? Right? Go to the well and fetch me some water. As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. This is where things get a little interesting. And I think the woman's response might have a little bit of uh, attitude here. Right? I'll never do that again. I'm sorry. <laughs> hope I didn't. Uh, she says this. <laughs> As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug, and I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah says to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do what you have said, but first make, first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make some for yourself and for your son. Give first to me, the man of God. And then, with what's left over, make for yourself. New instruction to Elijah, go to Zarephath. The thing that gets a little weird here, right, as I was reading it, I used the tone, is that Elijah goes to the starving widow and asks for bread. And we, we grow up in the church. If you've grown up in the church, if you've been in the church for a while, we have these prejudices, right, where we think, like, we, we're pretty sure what God would do, and we're pretty sure what God would ask. And so when we read this, it goes like it bounces right off. You, you hear what God is asking of this, like, starving, dying widow? You've got almost nothing, but I have use of it. Give me everything that you have that's left. Really, God? Would God really ask a poor, dying widow to give the rest of her flour to mix with some water and give to this prophet? Well, apparently he does. So, of course, this is what happens. This is what Elijah says. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says in verse 14. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. Catch that? I'm more like the widow because I'd be more likely to complain and be like, really, God, you're going to ask me to do that? But she complains, but then she does. Oh, man. God has drugged me into most of the things that I've done in my life. I have not gone willingly most of the time. This is probably, well, maybe the second time, maybe second or third time that God told me to do something like, okay, I'm not going to fight you too long. I fight him a little bit on the California thing. I opened up. I didn't argue with him when I married Allison. He spoke to me about that. Anyway, other stories. <laughs> he spoke to Allison about it way before he asked me, or spoke to me about it, which made it interesting. Okay. Here's what I want to say, and then we'll, uh, we'll keep going here. I'm going to try to get you out on time. When God makes these unusual requests of us, it's because he knows what's coming. He knows the why, and he knows us so well that he knows actually what we need. I usually think I know what's best for me, and God usually asks me to do something else. 
that's better for me. And I usually don't see it right away. Sometimes it takes me a couple of years. But every time I've said yes to God, it's required sacrifice, it's been hard, but it's been like the best thing. I actually, I don't think I've done a single truly meaningful thing in my life that hasn't been in response to the voice of God. And sometimes I, you know, I mean, I'm a crier anyway, but you know, it'll, I'll, we'll be crying because it's so hard. But I say yes, and I hang on to that calling, and it's just like God sustains me, and it's worth it, and I do it, and some of you know what I'm talking about, and some of you think I'm crazy, some religious crazy person, I don't know. But there's life there. There's life in hearing the voice of God and obeying it. And he can ask us to do anything he wants because he's God. Right? Sometimes we're Western American type people. We think we're gods of our own life. No, no, no. He's God. Of, he's God. Okay? God provides for Elijah. God provides for the widow. God asks hard things of both of these people. He asks Elijah to go against his common sense. He asks the widow to give up everything. To say yes to God in these situations meant giving up everything. So, I want to back up just a little bit because God shows up for the woman. But in verse, uh, you put up the slide, I think it's verse 12 and 13, maybe 11, 12, and 13. There's some interesting things that go on here. There's, Elijah says something interesting. After the widow complains a little bit, remember the attitude? Then Elijah says this, don't be afraid. This is something God says over and over and over again in the Bible. But it reminded me of a passage in Luke 5. This is the passage where, you can turn there if you want, we won't be there for long, where Jesus calls his disciples to himself. And what happens is Jesus gets in the boat with a couple of fishermen. And uh, he asks the fishermen to do this really dumb thing from fishermen terms. Because they hadn't caught anything all day. And Jesus says, just take the net, throw it on the other side, and they bring in all this fish. Like, despite all odds, despite all common sense, they bring all, in all this fish. And here's what happens in Luke 5, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You ever wonder why Peter says this? It's because he had just seen this miracle. And I think he realized that he was in the boat with the divine person. And most of the time in the Old, Old Testament, if God shows up, it means you're about to die because the glory of God is so intense and the sinfulness of man is so pervasive that the two things like don't mix well. Peter thinks God is in the boat and Peter, I think, Peter thinks he's going to die. And so he says, go away, for I am a sinful man. Jump down a couple of verses to verse 10. And Jesus says to Simon, do not be afraid. Right? There's this incredible word of mercy and grace saying, I'm in the boat with you, Peter, but you're not going to die. This hasn't even really, this hasn't happened yet. Jesus hasn't died yet and taken away the sins, but it's almost a foreshadow of Jesus saying, the sin you've got, I'm going to take care of it so that I can be in the boat with you and you be in the boat with me so that we can be in this kind of dynamic relationship and you don't have to be afraid. And then Jesus makes a request. Remember, he can ask anything he wants. From now on, you will fish for people. And what happens? So they did. Doesn't actually use that word, but so they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything. Can you imagine? Left everything and followed him. The family business, they walked away. The career path they had set before them because probably their fathers had fished and their grandfathers had fished. They left the family business. They left the family boat. It seems as if they didn't hesitate. And they followed him because when they looked into the face of Jesus, 
they realized it was as if they were looking into the face of God the Father himself. And so they obeyed. They didn't know what they were getting into. They would be on this grand adventure for the next three years. Their best friend and great teacher would die on the cross. Most of them would suffer and die. But they would perform miracles and they would see thousands and thousands of people come into relationship with the living God. Because they heard the voice of Jesus and they followed and they went. The theology around Jesus' divinity uh, is elaborated in lots of places in the letters of Paul. I want to just stop on Romans 10, verse 9, where it says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So saying yes to God, saying yes to Jesus, following his voice, assumes this fundamental statement. And I don't want you to hear this as like, if I do these two things, then I've earned God's favor and then he'll love me. No, this is like, this is the opening up, okay? This becomes the saying yes to God, this declaring Jesus as Lord is like the, the channel through which God's grace flows, okay? But the statement Jesus is Lord is a profound one. It's a political statement. It's a bold statement. It's a risky statement for people to say in the first century. It's political because to say Jesus is Lord implies something, that Caesar, that Rome is not. And Rome and Caesar was the place that all the people knew they were to turn for their peace and their security and their economic prosperity because they had provided those things to most of you know, that area around the Mediterranean Sea. I was gonna say most of the known world, but that leaves out China in India and everybody else, you know, the millions of people. Saying Jesus is Lord is saying, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. So this is political. This is risky. This takes courage. So this whole thing about saying yes to God assumes something, the lordship of Jesus. That's what this is all really about, the lordship of Jesus. This is an archaic term that points to really the kingship of Jesus which is kind of an archaic concept, but essentially it's saying, Jesus, I'm going to put you in authority over my life, over every decision, all my dreams, all my goals, all my ambitions, I turn them over to you. Jesus says some really funny things in the New Testament. He says things like, if anyone wants to save his life, you must lose it and follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. If you want, (laughs) saying yes to Jesus here, I mean, first you have to say no to yourself. And that doesn't mean that you don't get way more back. I think you become more yourself when Jesus comes into your life, not less of yourself. But there's there's an open-handedness. There's saying a yes to God in there. Uh, I'm called John Wimber, the founder of our movement. That's not technically true, but... In my mind, he's essentially the founder. He, he used this language to point to the lordship of Jesus, the kingship of Jesus. He said, I am change in God's pocket, and he can spend me however he wants. This is like writing a blank check to God, right? Do you understand the metaphor? Like, if I, if I, I don't really carry change. I don't even carry cash. But if you've got change in your pocket, right, it's just, you can spend it however you want. The quarter doesn't say to you, I would really like to go in the gumball machine so I can hang out with all my other quarter friends, right? You say to the quarter, I'm going to spend you on a Starbucks latte or whatever you want. I'm going to give you to that guy on the street. I'm going to, I get to decide where the quarter gets spent. Tracking? Tracking? This is about the lordship of Jesus. This is about saying yes to Jesus. Um, And I've I've got one more blank on your sheet. I've got one more blank on your slide. This is where I'm going to end. Surely God won't ask me to. And that's an open blank, people. That's something that only you can answer. So I want you to, when we worship, put that in your mind. Surely God won't ask me to, because here's the thing, he sure can, 
ask you. And I don't know what that looks for you. I can't answer that for you. It might mean I've raised all my kids and he's asking me to adopt another one. He might ask you to change career paths. He might ask you to volunteer at the free fall fair. Free plug. Uh, or he might, you might be in the place where he's asking you to say yes to him for the first time. To actually open up your heart and say, I want this living dynamic relationship. Uh, I want to acknowledge you as the king that you always have been of over not just my life, but over everything over the entire universe. This is the person that's come to us and said, follow me. If God asked a starving, dying widow to make bread for the prophet, he could ask you to do anything. And I'm not saying that he will, but this is going to get you in touch with some of your fears, with some of your idols. You guys know what I mean by that? Some of the things that you put up above God that you cling to, that you think will give you life, but really don't give you life, because God might ask you to take the grip off of the idols in your life and to open up your hand and say, God, this is for you. I put it in front of you to take, to give back, to guide, to lead, and to show me. So let's pray. God, I pray that your spirit would move here today, that you would actually enter into this dynamic relationship that we're talking about. For some of us, it's going to take courage. For some of us, it's going to take discernment and how to hear your voice so that we can know that it's really you and not just us and our own desires. So we pray that you would start to shape our hearts to want what you want to beat for what your heart beats for. And I pray for people who have never said yes to you, that you'd be giving them that feeling in their chest that longs for something more out of their life, that longs for an adventure, that longs for meaning, that longs for a dynamic relationship with you, God. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. We're going to stand. We're going to worship.